We'd like to bring this meeting to uh, order. Uh, roll call, please. Chairman Scott Valentine. Present. Vice Chairman Rocco Ally. Present. Stephen Ketterer. Present. Lauren Lustig. Present. Elizabeth Wynan. Um, Elizabeth is absent. Um, she had a personal issue arise, so she's not able to join us today. Uh, Timothy Schaefer. Here. Paul Littman. Here. And Ryan Dysinger. Here. Okay, thank you. Introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, introduction of guests. Uh, do you want to handle the, the guests? Sure. Sure. Good morning. Um, I'm Laurel Anders. I am a senior executive advisor. And um, first, I would like to introduce Paul Littman, who is our new director of boating for the Fish and Boat Commission. Today is his first day on the job. So um, we are um, having him dive right in and join the boating advisory board meeting this morning. Um, so he and I will kind of be tag teaming a little bit today, um, but you'll notice on your agenda that he is listed as the secretary to the board. And so he will be taking over that role and working with the boating advisory board. Um, so I just wanted to um, let you all know who he is. He's probably the newest face in the room today, um, but it would be good. Uh, we are live streamed. Um, so we have folks joining us through the link that's on our website today. Um, and this session is being recorded. Um, so. I think it would be helpful for those who are listening in on the phone to hear who's in the room today. So um, if we could start here at the end of the table, just remember when you're speaking to turn your microphone on, please. And then as our, once we go around the table, we'll start over here with staff and then continue through to the guests in the back of the room. We have a microphone we can pass around for those folks to use as well. So commissioner. Don Anderson, district four commissioner. Good morning. I'm Richard Lewis, one of the two boating at large commissioners for the state of Pennsylvania. I've served on a commission for seven years. I live in Gettysburg. Uh, Ryan Dysinger, I work for Pennsylvania State Parks, DCNR, and I serve uh, on behalf of our DCNR secretary, Cindy Dunn. My name is Rocco Alley. I serve as vice chairman to the Boat Boating Advisory Board. And I was a past commissioner with the Pennsylvania Federal Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Um, thank you. Steve Ketter, member of the uh, Boating Advisory Board, and likewise a past uh, commission uh, member. Scott Valentine, chair of the uh, Boating Advisory Board. Laurel Anders. Paul Littman. Hi, Tim Schaefer, Executive Director of Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and ex officio member of the BAB. Lauren Lustig, Boating Advisory Board. I live uh, near uh, Richard in uh, Biglerville, Pennsylvania. My name's Charles Charlesworth. I'm the uh, other at large boating commissioner. Ryan Walt, Boating and Watercraft Safety Manager for the Fish and Boat Commission. Mark Morrison, statewide public access program manager. Mark McLaughlin, chief of waterways and marina management. Sean Gimble, uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission policy planning and communications office. Katie Brashear, director for the Bureau of Administration at the Fish and Boat Commission. Ty Savercool, chief of the division of licensing and registration. Uh, Mike Parker, communications director for Fish and Boat. Tom Edwards, Bureau of Law Enforcement. Renee Cluck Keel, I'm the Chief Counsel. Bob Cassis, Policy and Planning Director for the Commission. Penny Ayers, Counsel for Property Services, Fish and Boat Commission. Ward Bales, guest and visitor of Commissioner Anderson from Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Larry Cross, I'm a visitor and I'm also with the Commissioner Anderson. Good morning. I'm Rick Taylor from the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. I'm the state liaison officer. Clyde Warner, Director of Law Enforcement for Fish and Boat Commission. Thank you. 
Okay, first item on the agenda here is the review and approval of our minutes from the June and August 2023 meetings. I'd like a motion. Second. Marco Ali moved. Steve Ketter a second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're at the point in the agenda where we'll elect our board chair and vice chair for the uh, upcoming uh, year. I would like to uh, nominate Rocco Ali as chair and Stephen Ketterer as vice chair. Okay. Any additional nominees? Like a motion to close the nominations? Second. All in favor of appointing Rocco Ali chair and Steve Ketterer vice chair, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed? Congratulations. All right, I'm going to vacate the seat. <laughs> Just grab your slide yours out, Rocco. Just slide yours off. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. You don't need my power of water, do you? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for uh, nominating me and electing me and Steve as well. Um, if we could move on with the agenda. Uh, under public comment, I have... Uh, Mr. Rick Taylor. And as Rick's going to the microphone, just wanted to remind folks that this session is being recorded. By participating in this session, you're consenting to the recording, retention, and use of this session. I'll give one more reminder. Reminder uh, members to please push the button when you're speaking on your microphone. And Tanya, if anything goes awry, if anybody's not pushing the button, speak up to let us know, please. Thank you. You're, you're actually really in charge here. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Rick Taylor, United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. I'm the state liaison officer as well as the uh, legislative uh, liaison officer. So, if there's anything I can do to help, uh, you know, for the this year, I'm, I'm here. Um, just a quick recap on a couple of things that uh, transpired last year. Um, if I can see it here, it's a little dark in this corner. Um, last year, what, what, one of our duties is when there is no towing facilities, uh, operators in the area or we're a come upon. All right, so we assist people. One of our big areas is we do a lot of assistance down on Lake Clark, which is down in, um, you know, Lancaster, York counties. They're, uh, you know, below Route 30. And uh, there's a lot of activity down there last year. Uh, we're showing that uh, we had basically 41 uh, search and rescues, uh, whether by come upon or by being called out on the phones or by uh, dispatch from the Coast Guard, because we also, uh, some of our numbers include some stuff that happened on the Delaware. Uh, we had uh, 41 assists of some level or another. We had um, assisted people. She was. Like I said, it's a little dark in here. I should have wrote it larger. Ah, I can see, I see the light. 131 people assisted, okay? And we assisted almost $2 million worth of property from further damage. Um, and uh, in one particular case, uh, the two of the people that were assisted was uh, two, we'll just say less than 21 year olds, um, brother and sister who decided that they, uh, their boat wouldn't start. And uh, so they decided that they were gonna take their uh, 
tow behind inner tube, one in each, no life jacket, and decide they're going to try to paddle themselves over uh, towards the island there, um, down on Lake Frederick, uh, I forget the little island next to um, Shelley. And um, needless to say, they didn't even get themselves to the, to the current when uh, we uh, spotted them and said, uh, you're not going to do this, uh-uh. So uh, we, uh, needless to say, gave them a uh, towed escort with life jackets on over to their grandmother's house. And I, when I heard, even while I was pulling away from the dock, they were getting um, their due, so to speak. <laughs> Um, how that wasn't really a smart thing. In terms of classes, we held uh, 17 uh, different public education classes, whether it be uh, one sailing course to eight hour courses to um, the, uh, we actually run a 13, 14 week course where it really gets in depth. We had 17 total classes. Uh, number of, of enrollees was uh, 722, 704 um, successful graduates and 283 of those were uh, 17 and under. So that's my basic report. Anybody have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer now, later, or I'd like to say reach out and I'm here to assist you. Thank you. Any discussion on anything that uh, Mr. Taylor had to say? Seeing none, we can move on to any old business. Yeah. Um, before I run, run off here, is there anybody else that has a public comment that they want to make at this point? I can't see Bob and me, but no. no. Okay. All right. Any old business to come before us? Okay. At this time, can we... Move into uh, new business. We have a um, boning rental business um, regulation change, and we need to go through that. Laurel, I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you. Okay. Um. We have a PowerPoint presentation to go through the commentary that was included in your agenda. Um, so if you want to direct your attention to the um, PowerPoint presentation, we'll just kind of carry you through the amendments. Um, as you know, we've briefed, we've briefed uh, the voting advisory board and the commissioners at several different times over the last year and a half or more on our efforts to work with boat rental businesses to enhance safety for renters and also to ensure um, enjoyable experience for renters uh, because we truly believe that boat rental businesses play an important part in boating safety in Pennsylvania. And so um, you may hear us bounce between two, two um, references in the way we talk about these businesses. Boat rental businesses are also known as liveries. Um, and they provide important introductory experiences for newcomers to boating. They also provide convenient adventures for people who are already outdoor recreationists and who may not want to tow their boats to, you know, a location they're visiting for vacation. Um, they also provide opportunities for people to participate in boating without the commitment of boat ownership. And in some cases, they provide some really unique experiences throughout Pennsylvania. What we've noticed is that boat rental operations in Pennsylvania have increased in number and have expanded the available opportunities for rentals. There are a wide variety of rental services throughout Pennsylvania and they um, offer services to a broad diversity of people and they're often a gateway to boat ownership. And again, boat rental businesses play an important role in boating safety and establishing a safe boating culture. So we really uh, felt like this was an area we wanted to dive into and make some improvements. As I may have mentioned to you um, a year or so ago, the very first meeting of the Boating Advisory Board occurred in February of 1963. And one of the first items on their agenda was to discuss challenges with rental operations and how to better engage with liveries. So um, this is a topic that has been in discussion for quite some time, and it's um, probably an area that we should always be striving to improve upon. 
1994, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission adopted regulations relating to boat rental businesses, and those regulations were last amended in 2003. Um, in 2012, the executive director at the time um, produced guidance relating to boat rental education requirements and safety orientations, and that's when that was um, last updated. And as we've mentioned to you previously, in 2022, we created an internal livery work group to consider the improvements um, to the Fish and Boat Commission's boat rental business regulations and the requirements to enhance compliance increase boating safety and reduce conflicts on the water. The livery work group um, had representatives from all six regions of the Fish and Boat Commission and our headquarters office. And you may remember last year we invited one of the work group members to sit with you here in the boating advisory board meeting and talk about her experiences on the on the work group um, and some of the common themes that came out of that. And her name is Rachel. Turner Diaz, she's one of our waterways conservation officers. We had folks on that work group who had a range of experience, um, many years of experience to some newer folks on the on the commission staff, and they interact with a wide diversity of livery operations. We wanted a good cross section. So as part of the work group, they discussed what's working well and not so well with the current regulations and requirements. And you'll see some of the tasks that they accomplished here on the screen. Um, we did a lot of review of existing re regulations and guidance. Um, we got out, they got out into the field and got input from other waterways conservation officers, liveries across the states and other states. Um, we took a lot of time discussing opportunities for where we could improve our regulations and guidelines. We reviewed our current safety orientation materials and some new safety orientation materials, including videos. And we also consulted with DCNR staff who oversee the boat rental concession agreements within state parks. Um, so there was quite a bit of work that happened internally. And here are some of the challenges and opportunities that that internal effort identified. Um, as I mentioned, boat rental businesses have increased in number and type in recent years. That creates a challenge and an opportunity for us. Um, and we have very limited information on livery operations throughout the Commonwealth, and that ultimately hinders our ability to connect potential customers with rental opportunities, communicate with those rental businesses, and build relationships with rental business operators. Additional challenges and opportunities that were identified as that part of that internal effort um, indicated that some of the boat rental regulations that we currently have in the books lack clarity or are outdated and um, the educational resources that we have available could be improved. They could be specific to the type of boat being rented. Um, they should be um, updated to reflect up-to-date information and um, use technology when it's available. And one final slide of challenges and opportunities. Um, what we discovered as part of our involvement with the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators is that the U.S. Coast Guard um, has a National Boating Safety Advisory Committee that is currently conducting a study with the goal of identifying recommendations for safer rental vessel operations. And some of the very initial findings indicate that rental incidents increased more than general boating incidents um, across the nation post-pandemic. Also, one of the initial findings was that states with the highest percentage increases and ratios of rental boat incidents did not have boating safety education requirements. And the study results um, are ongoing, and we um, anticipate that they will identify additional opportunities for improvements to our rental regulations and safety orientation resources and more. So we will stay in tune with that national effort. So in addition to that inward facing assessment and the work group, we also did some outreach and information gathering. Um, myself and uh, members of the boating team went out and actually met with boat rental businesses in person and we did some interviews with them. We also prepared an online questionnaire, which I believe we shared with the boating advisory board members. That online questionnaire was directly emailed out to more than 250 email addresses. We also pushed it out through a press release. 
We asked our waterways conservation officers to take that press release and visit with liveries within their districts and share it with them and encourage them to participate in the questionnaire. We also shared the questionnaire opportunity with our water trail network because we know that there are water trail managers all over the state who have great relationships with boat rental businesses in their communities. We also pushed the uh, questionnaire out to county tourism offices. We connected with our friend Rick Taylor with the US Coast Guard Auxiliary and asked that he share it with other auxiliarists who may know of boat rental businesses in their area. We queried our boat registration database where boat rental um, businesses, when they register their boats, they are supposed to indicate a use code number three, which indicates a rental boat. So we were able to tap into that as a resource and um, capture a few additional contacts out of our database. We also um, worked with the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to um, push the questionnaire out to their concessionaires who already do livery operations within state parks. We also shared it with our friends at the National Marine Manufacturers Association and perfect timing. Um, Jesse McArdle, who represents the NMMA, just stepped into the room and is joining us today. Um, and we appreciate him being here. Um, also, we shared the questionnaire out at a few conferences and symposia. So we really tried our hardest to get this questionnaire out into the hands of these people who, frankly, we really don't have good knowledge of who these rental businesses are. So, um, you know, we tried to work our networks to get the questionnaire out. Um, so out of all of that effort, we got about 58 responses to date, and they are still trickling in. Um, our questions on the questionnaire related to, I think we've shared this information with you already, but basic rental information, operations, are they familiar with our regulations and requirements? Uh, we asked them for their feedback on our current safety orientation materials. What are their greatest challenges? Because we would like to know if we can be helpful in overcoming them. And what kind of ideas did they have on how to enhance customer safety and rental experiences? We also invited them to specifically review the proposed regulatory changes that are in your meeting agenda today um, and the updates to the safety orientation guidelines and give us feedback on those. So as part of the questionnaire, here's some, some of the um, responses we received. As I mentioned, we got about 58 responses. Overwhelmingly, the types of boats being rented throughout the state from those who responded are the unpowered boats, canoes, kayaks, paddleboards, sailboats, sailboards, rowboats, um, and then motorboats came in a close second. Um, personal watercraft third, um, other types of unique boats, and then whitewater rafts, guided or not. Um, another piece of information we asked was how many years have they been in operation and what kind of rental type do they have? So to help you out a little bit across the bottom, the categories are less than one year, one to three years, four to six years, seven to nine years, and 10 years or more. Then the colors um, correlate with the type of business they are. So a brick and mortar store, meaning a physical presence, a retail business type scenario, that's the blue bar and you can see 10 years or more, most of the rental businesses that are brick or mortar have been in existence for 10 years or more. The green color is temporary or roadside or pop-up type businesses, which we believe to be newer. Um, and you do see a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a green bar in that one to three years. Um, it was also interesting to note that there are a few of those that are also ten, been in existence 10 years or more. Um, website only businesses, meaning they have a web presence, you do your rental through the website, um, and presumably a safety orientation through a website when at the time of booking or potentially in person when you come to pick up the equipment, you can see a, a even presence of website only over the, you know, less than one year through 10 years or more. And then the other is like the backyard businesses, those hybrid online meet in person kind of um, opportunities, which have really kind of come on the scene, we believe in recent years, um, although we do see a few that are 10 years or more. So we're still diving into this data and 
trying to connect, um, make connections between the different pieces of data we asked about. So um, we also asked, do they provide a pre-trip orientation on how to operate the boat? And thank goodness, not one of the respondents said no. <laughs> um, so you don't even see no on the chart. Um, yes, overwhelmingly, um, that's the unpowered boats um, is the green bar. Uh, they're providing a pre-trip orientation nearly all of the time. So yes, um, and sometimes. Then um, motor boats are required to have a pre-trip orientation and all of the motorboat respondents are reflected there in that blue bar. They all said yes. So just some interesting data we're getting. Oh, also, the PWCs were all yeses. Um, so interesting data that we're collecting and still digging into. Um, I think I have one more chart here. Two more charts, actually. How do how do they deliver the safety orientation? This is interesting to us so that we can be sure we're providing them with relevant materials that are convenient for them. Um, the highest number of respondents, it's all the way on the left side of the chart, was a verbal review of regulations and operations. Um, then a verbal review of hazards. Next was a map of hazards or the operational area. Next was um, they used posters and signs. Next was um, they use a checklist for the renter. They go down through a checklist to make sure they're covering everything. Next was videos, then other, meaning they provide a guided trip experience. Next was virtual or internet based safety orientation. Um, a few gave a verbal test, a few gave a written test. And thankfully, again, no one said they didn't know it was required. <laughs> so, um, Overwhelmingly, we're seeing people kind of do what we might call the old fashioned way of a verbal review um, of the regulations and operational requirements and a verbal review of the hazards and providing a map. So um, that's pretty much in keeping with the intent of the current safety orientation requirements. Then, as I mentioned, we asked these boat rental businesses, what are their greatest challenges? And overwhelmingly, the number one response was inexperienced operators. Then customers not following rental agreement or rules. Next was getting customers to wear a life jacket. Then um, customers not following navigation rules or rules of the road. Customers operating outside of designated areas, language barriers, Customers exceeding maximum capacity of boat, whether it's the number of people or the weight limit for the boat. Uh, user conflicts with other boaters, for example, anglers or other waterways users. And finally, insufficient or inadequate safety orientation materials. Other challenges that folks wrote in, um, because we did give them a write-in option, was customers littering. Um, not being able to operate in state parks. So there were some um, boat rental businesses who would like to operate in state parks. Um, complying with government regulations is a challenge for some of them. Tubers um, being on the waterway and crowding the waterway and weather. So um, these gave us some insights into how we can move forward with creating a boat rental business program that is useful to boat rental businesses and helps them overcome their challenges in addition to increasing safety. We also gave a fairly generous um, opportunity for them to provide just open-ended responses. Is there anything else they wanted to share with us or offer to us as they reviewed these boat rental business um, regulations and also the um, the completion of the survey. So you see the responses on here. I was um, very pleased to see that they, that there was a general interest in enhancing boating safety within, like embedded within these responses. Um, so there were, these are kind of the common themes that we heard. Um, there was an interest in better education to help reduce user conflict between different waterways users. Uh, there was an interest in enhanced safety signage and printed materials. 
Um, they did request simplification or clarification on the safety orientation procedures and where and how to get the resources to do them. They indicated an interest in updated training materials and guidelines. Um, I was very pleased to hear that there's interest in visits, having visits from Fish and Boat Commission staff to refresh them on rules and regulations on a regular basis and to share with them some common mishaps that occur on certain waterways where they may be operating their businesses. Um, they also indicated they get um, visited by a lot of other boaters who are generally in the area and ask a lot of questions. Um, so they were wondering, you know, could we provide information for other boaters in the area, not just for the renters? Uh, some would love to host a boating safety course at their sites in partnership with us. Um, which was very heartwarming. Um, they also are interested in instructional courses that we could provide or other entities could provide to boost their businesses, um, public service campaigns on life jackets, encouraging boaters to get boater safety ed certificates. And they also indicated that the customer profile has changed. And that one in particular was interesting to me um, and we actually heard it in one of our in person site visits as well. And that um, to explain that a little bit further, um, the, the business operator that described this to me said that it used to be that people who came to the rental um, to, to take boats out in the water were already sort of outdoors people interested in outdoors activities and um, outdoor recreation. But that has shifted somewhat, and there are a number of people coming to rent boats now who don't have that outdoors interest and that outdoor mindset. And so when they come to the boat rental business, they're surprised to see notes in the safety orientation that say things like, there may be snakes on the shoreline, or you know, rocks could be hazardous. There are hazardous conditions here. And there was a comment made by the business operator that said, it seems as if people are coming to our boat rental business expecting more of an amusement park experience um, that has a lot of built in safety elements to it and not necessarily recognizing that it does have its own risks. So um, those are some of the open ended responses. So our team took um, all of the internal work group feedback and kind of married it up with this outreach that we got from the livery operators themselves and built it into the changes that we are proposing to the boat rental business regulations. And that's what's in your, that's really the meat of your meeting agenda today. And if um, I did take the one um, chart that was provided to you as an attachment and I broke it down according to the different subsections of chapter 117 of our regulations. And we've, um, we have the body of the regulatory language in the middle column of this chart. On the right hand side, you'll see the rationale for why we're recommending a, a change. Keep in mind that anything that is bold and underlined is um, additional language, language that's going to be added or proposed to be added to this regulation. Anything that is bold and bracketed will be deleted. Okay, so on this first section, uh, subsection, which is 117.1, this is where the definitions are laid out in this particular regulation, you'll see. Um, that there is one update to terminology um, to just change the spelling of the word employees. And under that is the addition of paddle boards. As we know, paddle boards are becoming more and more popular and we want to call them out specifically in this regulation to be more inclusive of all types of boats being rented, especially with that recent surge in paddle boarding. So, um, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like, we can just go subsection by subsection and see if there's any discussion or questions. Yeah, and if, as discussions come up, if we could meet with them at, the, at that time, I think it would be a, a lot easier to go through. Okay. So any discussions um, that we want to have, let's do them section by section. And Rocco, if I might, even before we jump into that, I just really want to compliment Laurel and team on the approach for doing this. This was a 
a huge effort, um, really collaborative, and it's <clears throat> just you know, thank you to the staff for all the work that you put into this. Um, you know, this isn't just a, something that we're throwing out there um, without public input. This was, I think, an unprecedented effort to find out what the businesses needed, um, what their customers needed. So just thank you for the approach that was taken to do this, and I think resulted in a great product. So thank you for doing that. And I'm sure as uh, the voting advisory board feels the same way because this was a monumental uh, uh, effort and it was well done. So on handing it back to you, Laurel. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we'll move to 117.2, which is the next section. This covers inspections and there are no um, changes proposed to this subsection. Okay. Um, Not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now we'll move to 117.3, which covers responsibilities of the boat rental business operators. This one has quite a few changes in it. So we want to, um, I can go through this one. In a little bit more detail, letters A and B, you'll see are bold and underlined, which means they're proposed additions. Um, so what we are hoping to do here is to, um, our intent is for every livery operator to provide their business information to the Fish and Boat Commission, including their business name, their address, the types of boats they're renting on a form provided by the commission. And coincidentally, that form currently exists as a questionnaire that we use to collect a bunch of other information from them that feeds back in to this process. So will that form also require them or ask them to include the bodies of order they are associated with? We had considered that, um, but we opted to not include that in that form. Mainly because um, some of them rent statewide. Right. Some of them have specific waterways. Some of them um, have a long list of waterways they rent. So it ranged from being very specific to very broad. And we thought that that might um, clutter up the way we want to share this information out with potential customers. Yes. If someone's looking for operator and activity, that could be a question that we add in, just like like you said, the um, the top waterways or what's the most common areas where your boats are rented. We could add that into the questionnaire, not necessarily making it a requirement, but if they want to provide it. Um, question. Yes. Are we going to develop an Excel type spreadsheet as we gather all of the liveries that are operational, provide our potential customers, if you will, uh, much like they do, um, they provide a um, Excel sheet for charter captains or mm -hmm. charters um, with rental operations. I would think that would make sense. Yes, we our spreadsheet is very outdated and that's where we have the 250, okay. you know, contacts in it. So we all of the contacts that are coming in through the questionnaire are being loaded into a spreadsheet that um, we are then connecting to our website. So the business, the location of where the business exists, that helps us sort it by county. And so a customer goes to our web page and they see a map of the state and they can click on any county and it will bring up the business that operates in that county. Good. Doesn't necessarily correlate with where their boats are operated, but gets them a little bit closer. Right. Um, and that seems to be very useful for potential customers. So the key here in this letter A is that we really want to be able to connect more potential customers with rental businesses 
and we really desire to communicate with rental businesses. So if a regulation changes in the future and we believe it's important for rental businesses to know that regulation change, we would be able to communicate it out to them. If we want to invite rental businesses to participate in National Safe Boating Week by doing some sort of a promotional type thing or to share out, you know, posters or whatever else we produce as part of the campaign, we can communicate with those businesses. Currently, we lack contact information um, and it, we really struggle with communicating with them. So that's the intent behind letter A and that kind of captures letter A. Letter B is um, indicating that any livery operator or employee who conducts the required safety orientation for a motorboat rental must possess a boating safety education certificate issued by us. Um, and really this is the intent behind this is to enhance the safety of motorboat renters and reduce liability for those liveries. Letter C, um, this one requires that the uh, boat rental business has to provide either boat registration or use permit if it's an unpowered boat on the boats that they're renting according to what's going to be required uh, for the waterway where the boat will be used so that the customer isn't being set up for a negative interaction with the waterways conservation officer. Uh, we want to make sure that if the boat um, renter, the customer, is renting a canoe and they're going to take it and use it at a state park or um, Fish and Boat Commission access area, that it has the proper permit or registration affixed to it um, as required by law. So, um, again, it's about enhancing the renter's experience by ensuring that those unpowered rental boats meet legal requirements of the waterways and access areas where they're being used. Did, and sorry, go ahead. Question. Did we get any feedback from particularly the larger kayak and canoe rental places about uh, launch permits or registrations? I know um, I was down at... Uh, the Monroeville show, and this goes back to my commissioner days, but um, one of the vendors that I know that's on the Kiskey River, you can't do that. And I goes, why can't we? It's a safety thing as well as if one of your kayaks decides, one of your customers decides and not want to paddle back upstream and leaves the kayak there, it gives you a way to get it back. I thought I had pretty good reasons, but he didn't think so. <laughs> But, or is there a way that they can register their fleet under one number or something like that? I'm, I'm just concerned over somebody saying it costs too much is where my concern comes down to. The feedback we've received is not necessarily related to cost so much as inconvenience um, for someone who has... Um, say a, a whole fleet of unpowered boats mm. and they want to purchase launch permits, it's time consuming for them to go through and purchase individual yeah. launch right. permits for those boats. And so they have asked us to take a look at a way to streamline that. Okay. Um, so that's something we can continue to look at. All right. Satisfies me. Um, then the last item on here is letter D. And this was this is a big cleanup for us. This is a big cleanup item for us because currently it's the way the regulation reads. It so, kind of sounds like it's optional. A livery operator shall offer, but if the customer doesn't want it, um, but we would like this to be changed to say a livery operator shall provide, meaning they will, they must provide to all persons operating rental boats an orientation and um, safety introduction. Um, including a review of the laws and regulations. And the executive director will provide guidance. On the content and documentation of this orientation. So appendix a was included with your, uh, your meeting agenda. And that is where you'll see the executive director's guidance. Um, so, as a reference, it's in there. But this is 
about ensuring that um, boat rental businesses understand that this safety orientation and overview of boat operations and waterway conditions is required. It is not optional. And it ensures that all renters, regardless of their knowledge or experience, receive a safety orientation and an overview of the local conditions and hazards. So that is the intent behind that. Any questions about these items? Uh, thank you very much for this th very thorough and outstanding uh, summary of what Fish and Boat is uh, doing uh, on behalf of these uh, livery businesses and the people that use them. Uh, it's sometimes it's helpful to, to compare um, what happens in other jurisdictions, and that's I have the ability to do that. Last uh, June, my daughter, Emily, and I went for a five day a uh, 45 mile uh, trip up in northern Maine, up a, a wilderness trip. And we uh, were working with an outfitter on this trip. And it was very interesting for me to think about how that played out. The outfitter asked me one question, basically, how many years of canoeing experience do you have? And I said, well, this is my fifth decade of, of canoeing. Uh, we were provided with a map, uh, PFDs, and the statement, if you don't show up on the takeout place at the end of your five days, we give you an extra 24 hours, and then we'll, we'll contact the authorities. That's it, okay? Um, it worked out beautifully, but that was the start and the end of everything that we received. You know, we were totally on our own. The, the, interestingly, the, the entire area of our trip was out of all cell phone um, usage. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, it was an interesting experience from that perspective, uh, likewise. And um, thinking about that kind of scenario in another state compared to what you've just described, I really have to compliment what you're doing on behalf of people who may or may not know much about um, voting. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. We have um, the 117.3 section is continued on the next slide. Um, letter E is boat rental transactions shall be made using a written agreement specifying the name and address of the boat rental business and the lessee, the names of all individuals completing the required orientation or introduction to boating safety and the rental period. The lessee shall provide a copy of the boat rental agreement to an officer upon request. Um, and this is to help um, ensure that waterways conservation officers have important details associated with the rental experience if an incident arises. Um, so if a waterways conservation officer um, ends up, you know, interacting with a customer, a rental customer, because of something that, you know, they see doesn't look quite right, and they interact with that customer, a customer is required to show a copy of the boat rental agreement. Um, there was some concern expressed in um, some of the feedback we got and some of the in-person visits we made uh, about the re a requirement or a perceived requirement that a customer had to carry a piece of paper with them, a rental paper rental agreement. And that's not necessarily what this is saying. Um, we do know that there are some businesses who do their rental agreements online and it's a digital agreement. So as long as the required information is contained in that digital agreement, and the customer has access to it, whether it's on their cell phone or, you know, when they get off the water, they ask the rental company to provide that um, agreement, you know, in, in writing. Um, that will cover the intent of this. We do not expect, you know, that people are going to carry paper copies of agreements with them. As many of you probably know, our officers have an opportunity to issue what's called a notice of violation. 
Uh, so if they interact with a customer and the customer doesn't have the required documentation on hand in the moment, like, for example, a fishing license, but they have purchased it, um, and they just don't have it on their body at the time, the officer can issue a notice of violation and the customer has so many days to produce that fishing license. Um, and so that would you know, certainly be an option available to an officer in this moment. And, um, and it, it is not a negative against the customer in any way. So um, then if we go down through to letter H, uh, it's really important that boat rental businesses notify the commission of all reportable accidents involving any of their rental boats. Uh, some boat rental businesses are great at this and will reach out and notify the local officer, you know, if there's an incident where there's damage to a boat or something or an injury, uh, something like that. Um, but there are some boat rental businesses that aren't reporting that to us. And as you can imagine, the more time that lapses between when an incident occurs and when our officer can contact the individuals involved in the incident, there's a lot of information that leaves our memories, right? Um, and so it's important that our officers have that information and can initiate an investigation as soon as possible after an incident occurs. There is another part of our regulations, it's chapter 101 that lays out specifically how boat accidents have to be reported to the commission. So that's why you see that reference in there to chapter 101. So how long do they have to report? It depends on what the incident is. So if it's um, an incident that involves in um, a disappearance or death, it's immediate notification. Um, and if it's an accident that involves injury or loss of um, equipment or damage to equipment, it's Ryan, help me out, please. 2000, I think. Within 15 days. So there's different timelines um, for when that has to be reported. Um, we do have accident reporting requirements identified in our boating handbook. I've been so focused on the livery regulations. That's one of the things that has slipped my mind at this moment. But um, okay, so that that is the summary of what's in one seventeen point three. Is there any more questions or discussion about? On 17.3, Ryan. I had one, um, and it's just logistics and for clarification. Uh, subsection F, which talks about the um, requirement for marking and identification, uh, letters, numbers, decals, at least three inches tall. Yes. I will check, but I'm about 95% sure that the requirements that we put in our DCNR agreements, it says four inches. So I thought just for consistency's yes. sake, uh, helps out an, an extra inch when yeah. it's out there with binoculars to see that it's a rental boat. Um, you may want to look at that. So. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, we'll move on to 117.4. This is the last subsection of this chapter that we are proposing to amend. Um the most of that first um, paragraph, which is letter A, is in brackets and bold, which means we're proposing to eliminate it and replace it with the language that's underlined. Many of you are familiar with our boating safety education certificate program, and you know that if a person completes a boating safety education course, typically they're about out eight hours long if you take one in person. You could be issued a temporary certificate um, to carry on your person while you're waiting for your permanent certificate to arrive. There's no other scenario in which the commission can authorize a, a temporary certificate to be issued. Um, so we are eliminating that temporary certificate from um, this particular section. And what we're saying here is if you're required to have a boating safety ed certificate, um, by law, because you were born on or after January 1st, 1982, and you're renting a boat powered by greater than 25 horsepower, or you're renting a personal watercraft, you're exempt from having that boating safety ed certificate when the livery operator verifies that you have completed the required orientation and introduction to boating safety. 
and the conditions that are outlined in the executive director's guidance. Again, that was that exhibit a document. Um, and so that would be the documentation would exist on that rental agreement. So this is intended to streamline the rental process. Um, it's not creating any additional burden for the rental businesses. Um, yet it is providing the renter with important safety information and a specific overview of the type of boat that's being rented. It allows renters to try out a boating experience for which they might otherwise be required to possess a boating safety certificate. This again realigns the commission's regulations with those national standards for the issuance of a temporary certificate. Um, which technically again requires completion of the official boating safety education certificate course. In the section where it talks about the boater safety certificate. Should that also include language? If a person has their captain's license, US Coast Guard captain's license, would that substitute for that safety certificate? We, yes, we have that in another part of our regulations that, um. A person who has this, a certain Coast Guard level license is exempt from the boating safety ed requirement. Yeah. Um, I believe that falls into the definitions section, but that's a good point. I will double check that. Um, so this is the motorboat livery section. Um, letter B addresses specifically personal watercraft. We did experience, uh, we had some feedback from some boat rental businesses that asked about what this specified area of operation meant. Um, and a marked area of operation and they questioned whether that meant there had to be buoys out marking an area or if they could just call out like certain landmarks and say that's the marked area. And we also had some liveries that said, well, I, I mark it on a map and I give my customers a map. Um, we also talked with a livery operator who's using technology to mark an area of operation, which I struggle with comprehending, but it works. <laughs> it's new technology. So what we've offered here is an amendment that allows um, deliveries to specify an area of operation and that their customer would have a map that's carried on board the boat. Um, we are aware there's some boat rental businesses that do this and we receive great feedback from officers who interact with their customers um, in one scenario, a customer was off course. They were outside of their designated area and they couldn't figure out how to get their pontoon boat back to the dock where they rented it from. One of our officers interacted with the customer. Um, and of course, the customer couldn't really remember much about the rental, you know, experience and said, we just need to get back to the dock. And the officer was able to look at the map that was carried on board the boat and said, here's where you need to go, follow, you know, and pointed it out to them. It was really helpful tool for them to have. Um, so our recommendation here is that we eliminate that marked area, um, but there needs to be a specified area that is delineated on a map carried on board the boat for motorboat uh, for personal watercraft rentals. Um, and then also in that sub subsection two is um, providing immediate assistance in case of an incident or breach of the terms of a rental agreement. So this means the PwC rental company would need to have someone there as a qualified observer who can immediately step in and activate, go provide assistance if one of their renters gets into trouble, or if they see their renter breaking a term of the rental agreement, um, they're gonna hustle out there and approach that customer and, and provide corrective action. So that's the, the specific changes to the motorboat liveries, including the PwC livery regulations. Any discussion or questions about yeah. those? Okay, that captures the amendments to chapter 117. Commissioner? I don't hear you talk about 
We've interacted with boat rental businesses that have that operate both ways. Some of them bring their customers into an office area and they have a designated space with a TV and they'll, you know, fire up the TV and show the videos. Um, we used to provide CDs of the videos. Now they're sitting on a website that a livery operator can um, tap into that website and they can download those videos and then play them on demand. They can just play them live right off of that website. Um, so if they have the technology and they have electricity and all the other um, goodies, they can do that right there in person. They could also link those videos through their website, or yes, through their own websites so that their customers can view those in advance to expedite the process. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, if they don't have the technology, um, then we need to figure out another approach for them. Um, they do have the option to, to use our rental posters, which cover a lot of the same information. So if you are looking at, um, Exhibit A, it does talk through the procedures to use. Um, so if it's an unpowered boat, you're showing a video, I'm sorry, you're, you're using a poster, you're describing the known hazard, you're providing the safety equipment, and you're getting them to sign documentation that they completed the safety orientation. It's optional to show videos for those because what we've found is that many of the unpowered boat businesses um, are a little bit more rustic and they're a little bit more remote um, and may not have the technology. Motorboat rentals really do seem to have access to technology and electricity to be able to do an online, um, you know, show a video at a TV monitor in many cases because uh, they need a Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, and if a, if a business really does have issues with, you know, getting those videos in hand, um, we can provide them, you know, with a contact to order a CD and they'd get them on a, um, a DVD to be able to use. So to kind of summarize, um, in addition to those chapter 117 amendments that we're asking the boating advisory board to consider, there's a number of other things that we have already taken care of, or we are continuing to work on. Um, one is the, the boat rental safety orientation guidelines that we were just referencing that are attached as exhibit a we've drafted those up. Um, we've updated our safety orientation posters and made them available on our website. We've added resources to the boat rental business page for um, the boat rental businesses to tap into to enhance their safety orientations. We are currently working with our Bureau of Law Enforcement to recommend procedures and checklists to assist waterways conservation officers with their annual visits to the boat rental businesses. So they kind of have an idea of what to look for, what to ask about. Um, and how to interact with these folks again, this, it's not an, it's not an inspection visit. It's a visit to um, take a look at at um, you know their procedures, answer questions they have, offer updates on regulatory changes or anything else that you know might have happened within the last year. It's really to establish a relationship with the the businesses. We um, have also been in conversation with DCNR about suggesting revisions to the concession agreements that help to emphasize safety. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to continue to collect information from rental businesses via that online questionnaire. 
And importantly, now that we have contact information for them, we are going to share updates with rental businesses and stay in touch and communicate with them. So that is the soup to nuts of our boat rental business changes that um, we're proposing to undertake. Okay. Um, at this time, does anybody have any public comment relevant to the proposed amendment changes to 117? Wait, so I need to do work. That would be great. And we'd ask that you go to the microphone, yeah. please. Oh, yes. Yep. We had a few guests join us um, while the meeting was already underway. So we're asking, um, we thought it would be timely to ask for additional public comment right now. Yeah, so formal. I like thank it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, as Laurel had mentioned, I'm Justin McArdle with the uh, National Marine Manufacturers Association. We're kind of the premier trade association for the marine industry, so boats. Engines, trailers, livery businesses, etc. Um, you just want to start out by, you know, thanking you all for, uh, you know, inviting me to be here today and share our insights. Um, really appreciative to Laurel and her team. I think, as you can all tell, they put a lot of work, months worth of work into this, and and really engaged with us, engaged with the businesses, engaged with all the different players at stake here to try to come up with something that's that's going to work for everyone and that's ultimately going to achieve the goal of, you know, enhancing and uh, um, you know, and just increasing safety overall on the water. So, you know, we've, we've had time to review, you know, the proposed changes and everything, um, in detail. Um, you know, we have also consulted with several of our members, um, who operate different livery businesses here in Pennsylvania and throughout the country as well. And, you know, overall, um, we don't really see any issues. We think, um, that it, it's really a good effort here to, to try to kind of expand these efforts and, and to be able to, um, again, really enhance and increase boater safety education. And, and from our industry's perspective, um, you know, boater safety education is, is really, um, kind of 1 of the most important initiatives we're working on nationwide. We've been able to get it, uh, enacted in over 30 states now and, and kind of the next part of that is then making sure that it's expanded and is being uh, implemented uh, to the masses as much as we can and, and we really think that you know what um, what these changes would do would be to sort of have that expansion um, and to be able to touch more people who are out there um, and ultimately to be able to ensure that all the operators who are on the waterways are safe and responsible um, that's kind of the biggest issue we see just like what um, that one comment they had had um, from a gentleman was, you know, issue of, of lack of uh, you know, user knowledge and education. Um, we definitely see that across the board. Um, so we're very happy to be here today and, and supporting sort of these efforts on behalf of the uh, um, Boat and Fish Commission to, you know, achieve that goal. So, um, and if anyone has any questions for me or wants to connect on anything boating related, I'll, I'll be around for the rest of the day. So thanks, folks. Thank you. Any other public comments? Oh, we're going to make a vote on this. Mm -hmm. at, at this point, uh, I'd like to hear a motion to accept the revisions to the amendments uh, in 117. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. I forgot one step. Any further discussion? Then I can. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Hearing none, everybody's in agreement. So it gone. Let me just uh, ask a question here to our chief counsel. Should we vote again since he asked for public comment? Okay, so just to rock it, just so since we did open it for a public or for discussion, there was no discussion. Let's have another vote, please. Okay, thank you. All right, since we've had discussion, do I hear a vote that we all agree on approving this? I'll signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Okay. As far as other, yes. Next part of this. Support. 
Thank you, Richard. Okay. Can we move on to discussion items? Yes. As part of discussion items, we have a, a few updates and presentations for you. Um, the first is um, the topic of abandoned and derelict vessels, and we've invited Sean Gimbel to present this topic. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Gimbel. I work with the Fish and Boat Commission in the Policy Planning and Communications Office. Um, I'm here to just float an idea uh, of a topic that's been out here for quite some time, um, slowly, slowly br uh, building some momentum. I don't have any slides because we clearly are in the very, very early stages of um, defining what the problem happens to be in Pennsylvania and what some potential solutions are. Clearly not as far as Laurel's presentation uh, was in terms of specific regulatory language. So. I just want to, you know, again, get the ideas out there. Um, you know, probably about a year ago, I think some of this kind of kicked off with the high profile abandoned boat out in the three rivers and um, slowly over the course of the summer, more and more interest from stakeholders and partners about the issue. And then in the fall, you know, it's, some folks tapped me on the shoulder and said, how about we start digging into this and see what's out there. So the first thing, um, you know, before we get into it, you know, we're using this abandoned and derelict vessels title for this. Um, and Pennsylvania law doesn't necessarily come out and address them, but generally speaking, when we're talking abandoned, we're meaning that the owner is has given up ownership of the boat or there is no identifiable owner. And then when we get into derelict, we know who the owner is, but the boat is just neglected. You know, it's in a state of disrepair. Uh, so two distinctions not necessarily recognized in Pennsylvania law, but broadly speaking in other states at the federal level, that's a general theme for those two uh, types of boats that we're looking at. Um, we got into the fall somewhere around October into November. We designed a very, very um, quick, dirty, open-ended qualitative survey for our waterways conservation officers because they're the boots on the ground. They know what's out there. So we asked, um, you know, some very, very simple questions in terms of, you know, do we, do abandoned and derelict vessels exist in your district? If so, how many? What are the problem areas if you see them? Why do you think they're becoming abandoned or derelict? Um, do you have any kinds of solutions? So we, um, you know, we got that input from them, made our way through it, and I think, um, you know, just a couple high points from that. Um, we were, I think we were somewhat surprised that they, you know, were guesstimating at least 200 are out there on the landscape right now. Um, and um, it's not a uniform problem across the Commonwealth. About half of our WCOs said they had them in their district, and about half said they don't have them. Uh, and then in terms of the locations clearly southeast, southwest popped up um, a little higher than other places. It makes sense. A lot of people live there, northwest, but there are there was no region that was completely void of the problem. Um, in we asked for any specific areas or water bodies that uh, posed a problem, and they they came back with sixty different. Uh, locations across the Commonwealth where they they either know they exist or in the past have been a problem. And then in terms of the themes about why boats are you know, becoming abandoned or derelict, the first, there are two themes came out of that. And the one is the, you know, pretty, pretty simple, straightforward. People bite off more they, than they can chew with a boat. It gets to be too much for them. They can't keep up with the maintenance and the wheels start to fall off and, and, and it's just a bad situation. The other thing that we didn't expect necessarily or didn't think about going into it was uh, particularly with non-powered boats. So your kayaks and canoes um, and, and even some of the, you know, John boats and the like, um, they're not properly secured. So you get a storm, the water comes up and the boat, you know, washes downstream or comes, you know, loose in Lake Erie or, or another lake. And that's a really concerning issue um, just because when there is you know, not a person on a boat floating down the river or out in the lake, that triggers WCOs, emergency response personnel, 
and they have to be out there to verify that you know nobody was on that boat and everything is is okay in terms of human life and you think about it too that's during a cir circumstance that's dangerous to begin with you know generally the water levels are high currents are going to be high um, there could be a lot of debris in the water and uh, we're really keen on trying to prevent putting lives in danger of those first responders um, and then when we did ask just in terms of you know what kinds of boats do you see out there those exact non-powered boats were the ones that they encounter the most followed pretty closely by some of the um, you know fiberglass recreational power boats not necessarily a surprise because there's not much you know scrap or recycling value in, in fiberglass and plastic um, so that was our wco uh, component again to just get a general feel for you know what sorts of issues are out there i have been reaching out quite a bit to partners um, we reached out to the partners at the game commission find out what they have on their properties dcnr state park state forestries to get some input from them uh, talked with you know, the Coast Guard and various other partners. Uh, and then finally, a lot of outreach to other states. Um, three st states that keep coming up as leaders in this area, Florida, Oregon, and Washington uh, came up. A lot of discussions about the kinds of programs they have. And I think now it's just a matter of, you know, digging in a little bit deeper. It's like, like learning more about their programs, learn more, more about their search, uh, situations. Uh, and seeing what would it be applicable here in Pennsylvania I, in terms of solutions. We don't, you know, we're coming into this, you know, wide open. Um, anything from, you know, fairly relatively simple things like social media and communications uh, about, you know, safe boating and, and maintaining uh, uh, the integrity of your vessels all the way to, you know, p potential regulatory uh, policy changes, even legislative changes if necessary. Uh, but again, we got to do a, a lot more homework yet, a uh, lot more engagement on the horizon in the coming months. And um, hopefully we soon get to a place where Laurel was with, you know, specific language or, or specific recommendations moving forward. And if I could, I could just add on to that and thanks to Sean for the research. Um, and we're anticipating a, a public hearing um, this spring. Uh, Anita Kulik, who's the state representative, she's the chair of the House Game and Fisheries Committee, has seen this, and she's from um, along her districts along the Ohio River, has seen this firsthand. Um, and we're discussing with her right now the idea of having a public hearing on this very topic um, at the Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh. We're, our partners with the Pittsburgh Safe Boating Council have been really aware of this, um, folks at NMMA and elsewhere. This is not a, a a situation that's unique to Pennsylvania um, and really just wanted to put on the radar screen of this committee. Not sure if it will require any regulatory updates um, or if it'll require any legislation, but just know that this is something we're looking into and anticipate that public hearing this spring. Yeah. Yeah, there's real, I mean, there's, and you know, the, the, the power boats, you know, if there's fuel in it, that adds 1 thing. I mean, there's, the, it, it gets really, really complicated. Um, and depending upon what sort of hazardous materials might be in the vessels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have a, a question uh, relating to this topic. Uh, if the owner uh, sort of abandons ownership or if the owner cannot be found, uh, does the Fish and Boat Commission then become the default um, owner of the boat? And if so, what is the disposi disposition? What, what happens to these boats? Sure, we have a, a process that's outlined in uh, the commission's regulations relating, relating to how another entity can take ownership of a boat that is abandoned and the owner cannot be contacted. 
And it's based on a national standard that was um, established by the National Association of State Voting Law Administrators. Um, and it, it it's modeled after best practice of, um, you know, contact has to, you know, to try to make contact with the owner. If the owner cannot be reached, then um, newspaper ads, it's kind of an old fashioned process, but newspaper advertisements have to be purchased to put word out that the owner is trying to be reached um, for the, you know, the boat. We've, we've undergone a little bit of criticism about the timeline that it takes sometimes to take and gain ownership of an abandoned boat. Primarily, it's deliberately a long timeline to ensure that that individual is given a fair chance to reclaim their boat. For example, if the owner has been ill um, and hasn't been able to get to where the boat is tied off, um, and so the boat has you know fallen into disrepair or whatever, the, the the individual who owns the boat, you know, maybe in a hospital or nursing home, you know, is just not in their normal location and, and isn't reachable by those normal methods. But someone in the local community sees an advertisement in the newspaper and says, oh, that's my Uncle Joe's boat. They're trying to reach Uncle Joe. Then, you know, that contact can be made. So it's deliberately kind of long to try to make sure that the, the boat isn't seized inappropriately out from under, you know, the rightful owner, but it does create an opportunity for someone who is interested in taking ownership of the boat to lawfully take ownership of the boat and then be able to register it in their name. While well, this procedure is taking place, would the boats be secured uh, at fishing boat uh, commission properties? Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, there are, I think, a variety of options that could come into play, but um, it, you know, if the boat is on our property already, we would secure it. And one of the exercises we're going through and, and looking into what might, what improvements there could be either in regulation or legislation is to make sure that the local government entity has the tools and the ability to deal with it. I mean, just like PennDOT doesn't wanna be every abandoned car having to come take it or the state police take that car, um, we don't want to be in the position of you know, an expectation that our, our WCOs are collecting all 200 of those demanded boats and then doing something with them. So, but if you could have it set up in a way that, you know, the city of Pittsburgh has maybe more or greater ability um, to deal with what you're looking at there in the bottom left hand corner, um, we think that, you know, given that local control resources and authority is probably the best bet. Yeah, but Tim. To, 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 I'm to sorry. your point, though, I think it's like the Commonwealth, the Fish and Boat Commission does not come into possession of any of these boats unless for some reason we would be the ones that would, you know, you know, they would be abandoned at one of our properties and we would pull it in and make sure that, you know, we're not taking the boat from whoever the, the legal owner happens to be. And I guess the other component to, you know, the, the, the conundrum here, the difficulty is that we limit ourselves to a very narrow subset of abandoned boats, which are those that someone sees value in and interested in buying. More often than not, there's no value to that boat. So there's no incentive for anybody to step up and take ownership of it. So I think that's one of the, the, the key components, of a, a tough nut for us to crack, but we'll, you know, that's one of the things we have to deal with. Good point. Yeah. Ryan? To our officers at this point, you know, when you look at the picture on the left, that boat is secured to the dock, even though it's a navigational hazard, it's secured to the dock. Um, I remember one abandoned boat specifically on the Mon when I was out with our officers. Um, it was aground, but not secured. And all it would take is a good rain and that boat is free to go wherever it wants. So do we have any ability to at least contain an abandoned boat so it doesn't become a moving navigational hazard. You know, my, my concern is that this boat sat there all summer and I appreciate the length of mm -hmm. trying to warn people and everything, but all it would take is one high water event and you got a 26 foot boat running free. So I, 
that's concerning. Yeah, I need to defer. Maybe Clyde Colonel Warner's here. Clyde, the question was, you know, what ability do do our officers have the ability to secure that to the shore if it's deemed that it's a hazard? In some cases as well, it becomes challenging um, based on the size of the boat and it being full of water in some cases and it's moving with the current. current. <laughs> our, our staff don't necessarily have the resources or training to safely remove a boat of that type. And so we're you know, ha happy that again, the purpose yeah. of this was to just let the boating advisory board know that we've been made aware that this is increasingly an issue in Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's likely we'll have more on this the next time you guys meet or next time we meet, excuse me. Ryan, did you have a question? I thought I said, oh. I was just going to make a point to your, to your last point that you made. I've worked for DCNR and state parks for over 20 years and I can count on one hand, I think it was three different occasions where there was an abandoned boat at a state park and we went through the process with the Fish and Boat Commission to um, become the owner of the boat, you know, through the change in title or whatever. I'm, I'm mentioning that because condition wise, most of them are not worth that. We, in those couple instances, we were able to turn it into like a work boat for the park or maybe a boat we could use for educational purposes, mm -hmm. things like that. But that was three uh, in over 20 years. So it's not um, something that we do regularly. But I'm sure there are a lot more than three boats abandoned oh, on state parks during that time. <laughs> Just don't, don't want the listeners very, very to think true. that that's the only boats that they've got. So very true. big problem. Yeah. Okay, any further questions on the abandoned boat? Okay, can we move on with Mark on boating facility grants? Good morning, I'm Mark Morrison with the statewide public access program manager, and I got a few slides to go over this morning to explain the boating facility grant program. The grant program is uh, the funding for it is um, derived from boat registration fees, launch permits, uh, state fuel taxes, and other various state or federal grant um, grants. Um, the eligible projects that the um, that the facility that the program um, can fund is uh, property acquisitions design and engineering fees, expansion and rehabilita rehabilitation of existing boating facilities and planning for future access areas. Um, some of the construction activities uh, that it will fund is boat ramps, parking areas, access roads, um, permanent restrooms and signage. Um, the the grant funds are available to uh, public entities, including local governments and nonprofit groups. Um, it's generally required that an applicant provide a 50% match of the project costs. Uh, this 50% match can be cash, it can be in kind labor or materials. Uh, or it could be a combination of federal, state, or local grants. Um, some of the responsibilities that the applicant will have is they must own or have a long-term lease for the property. Uh, they must agree to keep the facility open uh, to the public use for 25 years. The applicants must agree to provide for all costs of the routine maintenance of the facility uh, for the term of the agreement. Uh, all work should be completed within a two year period. And the applicant is also responsible for obtaining the necessary permits and clearance fees for the construction of the facility. Um, to date, the, since the program was initiated, the, con the commission has received 254 grant applications 
and of these, they approved 138 projects. Um, it's a competitive grant, so all applicants are evaluated and scored by an internal review team before any determinations are made. Uh, the total value of the 138 projects was around 31 million. Um, the total amount reimbursed by the commission was 11 million, and the recipients uh, provided matching funds in the amount of almost 20 million. Uh, for the 2024 grant round that just closed in December, um, we received 19 grant applications. This map, uh, it shows the location of each project by commission district and watershed. Uh, these applications will be evaluated and scored by the review team, and we will make recommendations to the commission at the April meeting. Uh, the Southeast had the largest increase in applications this year. Uh, the commission received a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, and it issued a press release crawl calling for projects in the Delaware watershed so these funds could be leveraged. Okay, so the next steps for the 2024 applications, uh, we will compile the review team's feedback and rank each project. Uh, projects requesting more than $100,000 will be presented to the Commission to seek approval. Uh, projects requesting $100,000 or less will be presented to the Executive Director for approval. All applicants will be notified of the Commission's decision to fund their project. If the projects are approved, each cooperative uh, yeah, each project will receive a cooperative agreement. It'll be created in, uh, for each approved project. After the cooperative agreement has been executed, we will provide the applicant with a notice to proceed. At that point, they will have to complete the project in two years. After the project is completed, we ask that the re recipient help get the word out through their networks and on our end, we can assist with things like um, press releases, social media posts, or ribbon cuttings. Um, and I guess at this point, yeah, we mentioned earlier, the grant recipient is expected to keep the project open for public use for a period of 25 years. That was all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions for Mark at this point? I would have a comment. Uh, for many, many years, I worked for Carroll County Department of Recreation and Parks down in Maryland. That it would be just south of Hanover, Pennsylvania. And uh, a very well-received program was almost identical to what we've just seen here. Uh, it was called the self-help program. And groups or even individuals who wanted to to uh, provide upgrades to the parks. It might be something like providing a scoreboard or a dugouts for uh, uh, people who are playing baseball, for example. Uh, the uh, cost split in that case was 80-20, 80 percent paid for by the county commissioners, 20 percent funds by that group. And it was very, very well received. There was a lot of pride of ownership you know, where people really poured themselves into producing something of, of quality uh, that could be enjoyed by the public in a general sort of way. And so I'm in very great support of these kind of programs. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any further Rock, comment? Rock, if I could, just a couple of things. First of all, a lot of new folks and faces here. Paul, Mark, welcome aboard. Thanks for everything you're doing. Um, and a couple points on on the program. Special thanks to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for that million. We actually got a million dollar grant this round that's allowed us to leverage dollars in the Delaware River watershed like never before. We are actively working now on a similar application uh, for the Chesapeake watershed um, through a special grant program there uh, to bring additional uh, boating access to the Chesapeake. Um, and. I'm glad Ryan's here from DCNR. We deliberately and strategically work with DCNR on the timing of our grant program and DCNRs so one can be used as match for the other. They're different sources of funding, so they can they can be used as leverage. So that that's a really, really nice partnership. 
And I'll also say for folks that are listening, if you have ideas, uh, even though our application period starts in September and goes through December, we're looking for projects all year long. So if a municipality or others have project ideas throughout the year, please let us know. We're happy to make site visits, help you to, to tailor your applications to make them as competitively as possible, competitive as possible, but really, really excited about this program. Thank you, Tim. Any other comments? Moving on to Ryan for the boating incident report. All right, good morning, everybody. Excuse me. Again, Ryan Walt, the boating watercraft safety manager for the commission. And we just wanted to go over the uh, 2023 recreational boating incident analysis with you. Uh, this is something we previously uh, spoke about at the boating committee meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in uh, 2023, we had 48 reportable boating incidents with collisions and capsizing be the, uh, the number one types. Um, again, reportable boating incident, uh, death or disappearance, damage beyond $2,000, um, or somebody being transported to the hospital uh, needing treatment beyond first aid. We had 41 injuries requiring medical treatment uh, with property damage, a little over $200,000. Um, and I think it was um, one incident you can reference the boating accident analysis you all should have received before. Um, but I believe it was one incident um, was approximately $120,000 worth of that total, which was a, a boat fire. Uh, seven recreational um, fatal incidents, and within those incidents, there was eight fatalities. So as far as life jacket use, uh, and one of the fatalities, a life jacket was worn, but that was an incident down here at the Dock Street Dam, um, and that life jacket probably wouldn't have changed the outcome of that, uh, that fatality. Uh, then you can see there insufficient uh, life jackets on board uh, was five of the fatalities, and on board but not worn was two of the fatalities. So again, these are all, all just statistics, and we'll get into it. Um, a little bit more here. So, um, again, we talked about the uh, seven incidents, eight fatalities. Um, this is a decrease from the previous year and below uh, the last 10 year average, which was 11.4 victims. Um, factoring in the 2023 fatalities, uh, Pennsylvania's new 10 year average is 10.6, which is the lowest on record. And I'm spouting off a bunch of statistics here, uh, but keep in mind, if you look at the fatality recap and the narratives, we're not just talking about numbers here. We're talking about trends um, and actual people. Um, and again, we talked about the one individual that, that was wearing the life jacket in that dam incident. Uh, you can reference the incident analysis as far as where the locations were uh, between rivers and lakes. Um, you know, two to the incidents and fatalities were on rivers, moving water and five um, of the incidents and six of the fatalities were on um, lakes or impoundments. As far as the type of boat, um, paddle craft resulted in seven of the fatalities and by motor boat was one. And again, we talked about falls overboard and capsizing um, pretty much being the, uh, uh, the top two types of of incidents. And that's historically been um, been what they've been the last. Uh, several decades. We talked about the life jacket where, and as far as hypothermia or cold water shock, um, so any incident or accident fatality where the water temperature is below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, we're considering that cold water immersion, cold water shock has an influence on that, um, and that's defined by scientific research. So for the incidents and fatalities, uh, hypothermia or cold water shock was uh, a factor. And as far as drugs and alcohol, three of the incidents and three of the fatalities, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a factor as well. So does anybody have any questions on uh, that incident analysis and fatality recap that you folks should have received ahead of time? Okay. 
All right, so moving on, we can see this this chart. Um, everybody's seen it before. That's that's in the room likely. It goes from 1988 to 2023, and then we kind of mirror off the last 10 years there. And it's a comparison between the incidents and the fatalities. So you can look at the numbers, look at the breakdown. And one of the things that you can see from 1988 till now is just the continuous downward trend of incidents and fatalities. Um, and whenever we talked about this at the uh, voting committee meeting, meeting, Commissioner Lewis mentioned it, this being you know a marathon, not a sprint. So we're always trying to continue to improve boating safety um, through different techniques and outreach. Uh, and this is just kind of a snapshot of what the agency's done uh, for the last several decades. And, and it's, uh, it can be pretty impactful just to show the actual trend lines. Go back. And then in addition to this graph here, before we move on, I just wanted to take mention of, you should have received um, this snapshot with some of the regulatories or regulations that went into effect in certain years. So hopefully that's in front of you, but some of the things that um, that we kind of labeled out is whenever mandatory education was required for personal watercraft, and then whenever it was required for folks operating boats over 25 horsepower, in addition to the cold weather life jacket wear regulation, which we've seen that have a huge impact between um, you know, on fatalities within the cold weather months. So, anyone have any questions? Go ahead, sir. Just a comment. Um, in in rendering assistance, um, if I'm on a lake that is electric motor only, you know, no wake lake, and I have a gas powered motor on my boat, so I'm not using, I'm just using trolling motor to float around. If I see a situation where I have to render assistance, is is there is there any exception to the rule so that I can fire up that gas motor to get to them as fast as possible? Is that codified in any way, that exception, or is that at my own risk? Yeah, well, I know what I would do, but I'm assuming it's officer's discretion, but I'd put it back to the... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll bail, Ryan. It would be officer discretion yeah. there, and yeah, please go render assistance, yeah. and don't, <laughs> don't worry about the wake. Please do it, right, Clyde? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Are there any other comments? You know, again, I just want to you know thank our our staff for all the work that they do on boating safety. Um, say it all the time, but it's the number one thing that you know, we like people to remember after meetings like this. Um, thank you to the Boating Advisory Board for letting us know about opportunities you see where you live um, for us to get the message out um, as much as possible. And just a reminder that currently that the cold water life jacket requirement is in effect okay. now. It's November 1st through April 30th. All canoes, kayaks, boats under 16 feet. Uh, Ryan pointed out that, that we've seen a dramatic decrease in fatalities in those months. They've been cut in half in the last 10 years. So please wear your life jacket. Thank you, Tim. Can we move on to Waves of Hope Resources? Paul. Hello, I um, want to talk a little about uh, Waves of Hope here and these resources. And this is produced by the uh, National. Jumped ahead of the slide. If you want to go back one arrow to the. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so this is the Waves of Hope initiative, and this was produced by the National Safe Boating Council. If you're not familiar with them, they're a national organization. Uh, they produce educational resources. Uh, they engage in outreach, and they uh, offer training in uh, uh, boating safety. And they have uh, initiated a program uh, called Waves of Hope um, to help victims of um, tragedy, as well as to help uh, first responders and others to provide assistance in terms of what to say and not to say and how to provide this assistance. 
So um, when you have a, a open water tragedy, the families um, are forever changed. They're traumatized by this. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, all of the people who are responding to this, so the first responders and the law enforcement are also traumatized by these events. And this is part of a way to educate um, um, uh, these these responders. So in most cases, um, deaths are preventable, but deaths come about um, because of uh, what we term as cascading failures. So it's not that somebody's in a kayak, it's that they're in a kayak and it's cold weather and a windstorm comes up and they're not wearing a life jacket and you have these cascading failures and the person then um, passes away. So a lot of these are preventable by pointing out the things that um, could be done to prevent these uh, cascading failures. So this is done a little bit at a time and they have produced here. Um, this is their website waves of hopeboating.org and they've produced um, a bunch of materials here to help the various um, constituencies. The first here is this, which is 10, 20, 30 list. This is for first responders and officers um, when they're approaching a victim uh, of this to be able to uh, have some education on things to say and things not to say so that you can be helpful and not re-traumatize the person who's been affected. These are available to be handed out. And in addition to that, we have these cards that are for law enforcement officers to hand out at the same time when they uh, uh, can talk to the victims. They also can provide these cards so that the victims have this website handy that they can go to and get these uh, resources um, really to, to help them cope with the tragedy. It's a long-term uh, item, and um, what we want to do is, is you want to have uh, a conversation started so that they can uh, help uh, cope with this. The next uh, item they produce is um, this flipboard, and this flipboard has individuals and what happened to them. And this is good um, for boating safety instructors, but it's also good for us here to have a compilation of what happens and what these failures are, and uh, ultimately ways to address the public and preventing them in the future. Because obviously what we can learn to prevent this from happening again is gonna be helpful to the state statewide. And lastly, we have rack cards that are similar to the officer cards. These are um, can be presented, uh, you know, anywhere um, uh, for the public to pick up and use these resources. So um, the idea here is that the waves of hope uh, is to uh, provide these personal stories. Um, it provides um, a little bit of community engagement. Um, it provides uh, some cost savings as these are produced and can be handed out. Um, and lastly, we're providing these uh, not alone cards to officers around so that they can uh, pass them out and, and help people in these situations on the spot. Sometimes you don't know exactly what to say and every circumstance is a little different. And this, uh, I think, provides a template and a guideline. Um, in addition, we've got some flyers on the table as well as some stickers. Please, please feel free to take them with you um, and to go to this website and uh, uh, find out a little bit more about what is here. Um, does anyone have any questions on this or is there any discussion? What again is the uh, the 
authority, or not the authority, the organization that has provided uh, ways to vote. What, what is that? So this is the National Safe Voting Council. Um, they're well established. They've been around for quite a while, and they do, um, um, you know, other educational items as well. So they, um, for instance, they have the Safe Voting Council does um, onboard water training, and they provide um, coursework for that. Um, yeah. Oh, I find the messages about safety ones that move me the most are kind of the one this happened to me. This was something that happened to me. I'm a mother, and this happened to my family, and that's why my son or my daughter is dead. Or this happened to me, boating, canoeing, powered, unpowered, and I almost got killed, but I didn't. So it was a close call. And those kinds of messages to me have the most impact and have the most learning power for me. So I would encourage us as a commission to participate in this program, but take those, this happened to me stories and keep putting them out to the public. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Thank you, Paul. At this point in time, we have come to the end. Is there anything for the good of the order? So, Rocco, just one thing I, I will add, just want to thank Laurel as she transitions into a new role with the agency for all she's done. To, I think the for those that have been on the board, been on the BAB for a while, you know, the establishment of a Bureau of Boating was a big deal. Uh, I think we've come a long way in the last few years and just want to thank Laurel for her leadership and welcome Paul and um, anything I can personally do to make your job Better, let me know, but welcome aboard. Thank you. You bet. Anything further? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. We are adjourned and thank you for your attendance.